Hi everyone, it's Christy, and I've been thinking about doing this for a little while, which is to read out my doctoral thesis as not so much like because, you know, um, I, I want to get attention to my thesis. I mean, it is nice to get attention to your thesis. Uh, we spent a lot of time working on it, and it don't, generally doesn't get read. But more importantly, I want it to be out there as an example of how a feminist, a f feminist theory can inform our study of the social world scientifically and improve our understanding of what's going on or at least give us a clearer idea of what we're measuring and that's really what my thesis was focused on now in terms of doing this I'm going to do it as a screen capture and so it's not going to be very exciting to look at it's going to be more the audio side of it so I would suggest treating it as a podcast the other thing is I'm only going to do one take if I screw up, if I mess up, um, you're just going to have to deal with it because it's just it's I don't have that much time, and I'm sure you guys are going to be kind of understanding if I stumble over a word here and there. Rather, it's not a professional audio book, you know. You guys aren't paying 9.95 for this, so I'm sure it'll be okay. The other thing is that I will try to break it up into sections so that it's digestible, and each segment should be about 20 minutes in length. That's the idea. And what I want to do in this first video is just get going with the um, um, the overview of the thesis and and if my word document here works okay it's still working then um, I'll get on to chapter one now in terms of the thesis itself my thesis is written like a book it's not written in chapter like a, an article so it takes a little while there's a lot of background and it builds up to the statistical analysis so it takes a little while to get going until we get into the real numbers but all of the background is necessary to understand what I'm doing in the research and in the study so let's go ahead and just get started and I'll scroll down here you might hear some uh, bits as I'm scrolling down and let me hit we'll go to the abstract and I'll start with that Using data from a, a 2007 internet study with a number of cases of 2,890 designed to investigate gender and sex as sources of heterogeneity in political preferences, this thesis evaluates sex and gender as separate measures for analyzing British political attitudes and behaviors. Statistical findings are reviewed that suggest sex and gender, as measured by questions from the personal attribute questionnaire, may be considered distinct concepts which should be conceptualized and operationalized separately, as they may offer unique explanation in empirical political analysis. In investigating the role of sex and gender in a particular form of political behavior, intention to vote, I conclude there is partial evidence to support the proposal that the higher an individual's sense of their own agency, regardless of their biological sex, the more likely they are to indicate they would vote. I present findings which indicate that a high sense of one's own agency is associated with right-leaning political attitudes, partisanship, and intention to vote, whereas a high sense of communion is associated with left-leaning political attitudes. In the final empirical chapter, I conclude that aspects of American gender gap theories, including the socialization hypothesis, can contribute to a more precise understanding of British political preferences. This thesis recommends that the gendered psychological dispositions of individuals is an area which should be subject to further consideration, investigation, and research in political science. Introduction Quote from Bertrand Russell Everything is vague to a degree you do not realize till you have tried to make it precise. The subject category under which my research falls has widened since I first began this thesis. What started out as a question about political behavior, specifically the explanatory roles of sex and gender as sources of a heterogeneity in political attitudes and behaviors, has widened beyond political behavior to include issues of construct validity and political psychology. By the end of this thesis, I provide an answer to the fundamental question which provoked my research. Are sex and gender distinct concepts that require separate measures in social science research? The short answer is yes, they do. However, the short answer is insufficient in light of the other results and implications which my analyses suggest. As is often the case with scientific research, I end this investigation with more questions than I started out with. Over the next several chapters, I will review the findings that answer the central question as to, as well as those that inspire new questions. Above all, it is my hope that the impact my research has on those who read it will be to plant the seed of a question in their minds and to encourage them, wherever they read a study, 
or hear a presentation about gender to ask, what does she or he mean by gender? The driving force behind this thesis is the application of the concept of gender to a political phenomenon, in this case, political behavior. Gender is a more complicated, often more nebulous term than sex. It is a concept that can be used as a euphemism for males and females, that is to say, biological sex. It can be used to refer to the social con construction of men and women's identities, or as descriptors of men and women in relation to each other, gender roles. As I note in the first chapter, while, while biological sex is a stable concept in that males remain males and females remain females over the course of their lives for the most part, gender as a descriptive category for human behavior or as a norm for human behavior has been transformed over time. Gender norms for a woman in 2008 wearing trousers and sporting a short haircut whilst studying a master's level for a degree in biology would have been shocking in 1908. When we think of a women's movement, many mistaking, some may mistakenly think this movement began with a fight for female suffrage. However, the real picture was very different. In fact, the suffrage movement was part and parcel of a wider women's movement that was questioning traditional gender norms as to women's roles in society. Women's, attempt, women's attempts to redefine gender norms began long before any organized movement to grant women the vote. To examine the case of, a, of Britain in particular, women as early as the 15th century were asking, asking why feminine perspectives of religious experience and females as individuals were not more respected within Christianity. Just because I am a woman, must I therefore believe I must not tell you about the goodness of God? Asked one early proto-feminist, Julianne of Norwich, in a tone that might strike might still strike some religious conservatives as radical even today, she went on to write about Jesus through a female lens, through the female experience of giving birth and motherhood. Quote, Our Savior is our true mother, in whom we are eternally born, and by whom we shall always be enclosed. We are redeemed by the motherhood of mercy and grace. To the nature of motherhood belong tender love, wisdom, and knowledge, and it is good, of, for although the birth of our body is low, humble, and modest compared with the birth of our soul, yet it is he who does it in the beings by women it was done. Such proto-feminists were advancing sentiments that were later made more explicitly political by their descendants. Females in their experience and feminine perspectives have value. By the latter half of the 19th century, these beliefs had coalesced into political movements with the intention of improving women's social, economic, and legal status. However, the first organized movements to advance the status of women were not focused on the vote, but often to educate girls. In 1694, Mary Astle's A Serious Proposal to the Ladies for the Advancement of Their True and Greatest Interests was among the first, following on from Descartes, to assert that men and women are equally capable of reason. Astle further argued that women's appearance as frivolous and incapable of reason was a product of their upbringing and not a natural disability, which demonstrated the need for women's education. By the middle of the 18th century, a few affluent British women formed an informal group called the Blue Stocking Society. Focused on, issues and, focused on social issues and education, the group supported, though never formally worked for, increasing, increased education for girls in order that they might be better wives and mothers. Neither Estelle nor the Blue Stockings could be considered feminists. Estelle herself was a Tory and a supporter of the monarchy, and the Blue Stockings have been regarded as anti-feminists. Yet they still challenged the norms as to women's intellectual nature and abilities, and as a consequence, how women were seen in society. By the 19th, 19th century, feminists criticized prevailing notions of the ideal woman. Marion Reed, in A Plea for Women, criticized the idea that womanly behavior was defined by attending to her husband, her children, and her household, and argued that this ideal of self-renunciation, living only to serve, was in fact a form of self-extinction. The importance of education continued as a theme among first-wave feminist women and men who promoted the education of girls and called for legal reforms to aid disadvantaged legal, the disadvantaged legal status of married women.
1825, William Thompson published Appeal of One Half of the Human Race, Women, Against the Pretensions of the Other Half, Men, to Restrain Them in Political and Thence in Civil and Domestic Slavery. In his book, with Thompson, with Anna Wheeler, attacked the laws that made married women little more than property. At that time period, women lost all legal rights over their earnings or property upon marriage. The legal owners of their earnings and property were their husbands. Women were denied rights to their children in the case of divorce and could lead lives treated as little more than upper servants by their husbands. John Stuart Mills, better known on the subjugation of women, argued not only that women's subordination was wrong, but it, that it was also a hindrance to human improvement. In the second half of the 19th century, several women formed groups, formed a group known as the Ladies of Langham Place, which initiated campaigns around women's need for better education, increased possibilities for employment, and improving married women's position in law. It was from these groups, what we would now call grassroots movements, that the seeds of the suffrage movement were planted, and in 1918, British women over the age of 30 were given the vote. Although the initial legal battle was eventually won, movements to further increase women's status in law, to act as equal citizens to men, to increase women's educational and employment opportunities, to allow them to earn an independent living, continued in the developed and developing worlds even today. Women's formal entrance into the political process in Britain and in the United States began less than 100 years ago, although there was speculation that extending the franchise to women would result in the emergence of a female voting bloc, the female vote was initially split along similar lines to men. Instead of introducing a radicalizing force into domestic politics, women as a group tended to vote center-right. The conservatives in the United Kingdom benefited slightly from women's enfranchisement, as did Republicans in the United States. Subsequent to the realization that women's partisan behavior was not radically different from men's, interest in women's political behavior faded. It was not until after the emergence of second-wave feminism, in particular the American presidential elections in 1980, that women's political behavior, distinct from men's, again became an area of interest. Thereafter, much of the research into men and women's political attitudes and behaviors focused upon the discovered gender gap in the 1980 American presidential election, and this notion of gender gaps has framed much of the subsequent research. This binary framework of male versus female was the initial springboard for my own investigation. In what ways are men and women's political attitudes and behaviors different, and in what ways are they similar? Early on in my doctoral research, it occurred to me that to organize a cross-tabulation by gender category, or more accurately into males and females, was not really measuring the associations of gender with political attitudes, but of the respondent's biological sex. This of course was not an original thought, but this conceptual distinction has been widely overlooked and under-investigated within political science. It is this distinction, and in particular the conceptual operationalization of sex and gender, which is at the heart of my research. A bit of disclosure seems appropriate at this point. While I am undoubtedly both a benef beneficiary of and have inspi been inspired by the work of feminists, this thesis is an empirical analysis of the application of a particular set of survey measures which attempt to capture the concept of gender to several different political behavior models. Several times within this work, I reference feminist theory, drawing upon and testing feminist accounts of gender gaps. However, I would like to take this opportunity to clarify that this thesis is not a normative feminist endeavor, but one which is concerned with the concept validity of the term gender, the measurement validity of sex as a proxy for gender, and how applying a gendered lens to political behavior increases or fails to increase our understanding of human behavior. As noted by the Enlightenment philosopher David Hume, one cannot derive ought from is, and I do not attempt to do so. The main questions that I attempt to answer with this research are is not ought questions, is sex a valid proxy for the concept of gender, and are sex and gender systematically associated with certain political attitudes and behaviors. That is not to say that there are not normative implications that others may wish to draw from reading my conclusions, the conclusions of my findings. However, ah, the time, sorry about that, the time to assert normative 
positions supported by evidence comes after accurate information has been arrived at through scientifically rigorous empirical analysis. This thesis uses data from an original internet survey of political attitudes and behaviors that incorporates measures of sex as measured by the biological category of male or female and gender as measured by the personal attributes questionnaire incorporated from the field of psychology. To answer the questions I have posed above, is sex a valid proxy for the concept of gender and are sex and gender systematically associated with certain political attitudes and behaviors? This thesis has been organized into six chapters and a conclusion. Chapter 1 provides the content and basis for the thesis by providing the historical and theoretical frameworks for the analysis of sex and gender in political science. In addition, I specify the terminology used throughout the rest of the thesis and provide a justification for studying British men and women's political attitudes and behaviors when it would appear there is so little difference between them. I review the American gender gap theories, which I organize into three general headings. One, increased women's autonomy or rational choice. Two, socialization accounts and three, feminist accounts and review the theories behind how the gender gaps emerge through differences in attitudes or differences in issue sal salience. I also review the previous findings of investigations into a British gender gap and the British gender gap theory, the generation, gender generation gap, and Campbell's findings on the importance of interaction effects. In addition, this chapter will review theories from sociology as to when and how gender socialization occurs, reviewing both childhood and adulthood socialization theory accounts. Chapter 2 builds on the distinction between sex and gender and reviews the development of measures of gender from the field of psychology. With two possible methods of measuring gender available to me, I review both survey instruments and justify my selection of the personal attributes questionnaire as the measures for gender in my study. I explain how I selected a subset of PAQ questions for inclusion into an exploratory internet survey dataset and why I have changed the term masculine to agency and feminine to communion in my description of the gender measures. These gender neutral concepts replace the more normatively loaded terms of masculine and feminine and are used to interpret the results of the statistical analysis in the final three chapters. The implications of this change in terminology are further expanded upon in the concluding chapter. In Chapter 3, I reviewed the study design for the Internet survey that was completed in January of 2007 by 2,890 participants to analyze the role of sex and gender in political attitudes and behaviors. In addition to reviewing the study design and the reliability of the measures, I also conduct ordinary least squares analysis on the three gender measures to better understand which demographic factors are relevant to an individual's gender perspective. The regression analyses of Chapter 3 demonstrate sex is only weakly related to gender, suggesting that sex and gender provide separate information which requires the use of separate measures in order to be more accurately operationalized. I also review the rationale for using the measure of gender as interval rather than categorical independent variables in statistical analysis. Having reviewed the concepts, terms, the survey instrument, and the study design, Chapter 4 is the first of three chapters devoted to the statistical analysis of sex and gender. Chapter 4 tests the explanatory power of gender when included in models of intention to vote and vote choice. Informed by the work of the British Election Studies team investigation into intention to vote, I replicate as much as possible several models from political choice in Britain and evaluate where and when sex and gender contribute to explaining an individual's intention to vote as well as their vote choice. The analyses of these the results of these analyses demonstrate that in certain models, an individual with a high sense of their own agency is more likely to express an intention to vote and to vote and to vote to support the Conservative Party, while in some models a high sense of communion is associated with support for the Labour Party. In addition, the sex variable adds little or no information to the explanation of either intention to vote or vote choice. Chapter 5 is an exploratory investigation into political attitudes. Using a model composed of socio-demographic variables and the measures of gender, I conduct ordinary least squares and logistic regression on several political measures, including left-right self-placement, scales of libertarian-slash-authoritarian attitudes, and socialist-slash-laissez-faire attitudes and political partisanship.
The, find, the findings of this chapter demonstrate that agency has a relationship with right-leaning political attitudes, while communion is related with holding left-leaning political attitudes. In addition, the sex variable is rarely significant in the analysis, more evidence that sex and gender require separate operationalization. In Chapter 6, I attempt, for the first time in political science, to evaluate the competing gender gap theories as outlined in Chapter 1. I'm just going to say, so I'm going to interrupt my reading here to say, I'm not entirely happy with that chapter, uh, so I'm not going to read it out. Uh, if you're really interested in it, by the time I get to the end, you can go and read this. But I think I'm just going to skip um, this operationalization of the American theories because it doesn't really um, add to the explanation that the other chapters provide, and it just gets a little bit long. So. Skipping this paragraph on chapter 6, I'll go on to the next paragraph. The concluding chapter presents an overview of the findings of my research, examines some of the conceptual implications of using measures of agency, communion, and emotional vulnerability, and points to areas for future research. I conclude that sex and gender measures should not be conflated in social science analysis. My findings demonstrate that measures of agency, when statistically significant, are consistently associated with right-leaning political preferences. Communion measures, when statistically significant, are associated with left-leaning political preferences. While the sex variable is rarely significant and shows no systematic pen pattern, as are found with gender measures. Although previous researchers have concluded there is no ideological gender gap in Britain, the statistical findings indicate there is an ideological gender gap in Britain, provided that one is using measures of gender to measure gender and not measures of sex when conducting the analysis. In the final chapter, I also reflect upon the measures of gender themselves and question to what extent are the personal attributes questionnaires actually measuring an individual's gender. Are these measures of agency and communion capturing the socially constructed norms for men and women, or are agency and communion more appropriately thought of as aspects of the human experience? Finally, I review areas of future research and analysis which my findings suggest. The core themes that were part of the women's movement from its earliest known expression, the idea of women's perspectives as valuable and of equal consideration, the importance of education, of economic in independence, and the empowerment which comes from employment can be understood as an attempt by women to challenge norms as to what was appropriate behavior for women and men by proposing an alternative framework for women's behavior which included a high level of autonomy and agency for women through increasing their education and their legal and economic, uh, economic autonomy. Feminists have argued that the aspects of humanity or human nature normally idealized in the feminine such as empathy, nurturing, and connectedness with others are not specific to one sex. This has challenged wider social norms such that previously sex stereotyped attributes have been reconceptualized. The process of disambiguating the term gender from the concepts of sex, sex roles, and social norms underpins my investigation and informs the conclusions I present at the end. As I mentioned above, including separate measures for sex and gender provides us with separate pieces of information to explain political attitudes and behaviors. My attempt my aim is an attempt to gender quantitative political analysis. Gender scholars have identified analytic gaps in existing social science concepts and made suggestions as to how to better incorporate gender into those concepts, sometimes developing new gender-specific concepts in the process. By incorporating measures of gender from psychology and including them with the variable of sex, my research will address a gap in the existing social science measures and may provide a better way to incorporate the role of gender into our empirical analyses. All right, so I'm going to stop this one here, and if you find that interesting, then click on it. I'm going to go ahead and, in this same segment, continue to read. I'll start with Chapter 1 and see how far I get before my voice gets out, and then what I think I'll do is I will basically continue on with this series if there is enough interest 
in me continuing. And that doesn't mean that like 500 people have to say yes. I just need some of my more dedicated subs to say yes, please, more, Christy, um, please record more, and that will be enough. So as long as there's a general interest, I'll continue uh, to read. And when I have time, I'll do a bunch of it now since I've got a little time to wait before my paragliding. I'm doing this while I'm holiday, which isn't a problem. I don't mind. I like doing this stuff. Um, this is my hobby, so it's, it's not really work to me. But I hope you guys have found this interesting. If nothing else, you get a little bit of a sense of what a doctoral thesis might look like. And since I said I would keep to 20 minutes and the screen recorder is telling me it is 20 minutes, I will stop there. So thanks for listening, guys. I've been Christy. You've been awesome. And see you in the next segment. Bye.